Hey, welcome to episode three of The Recovery Scene. I am your host, Leslie, and I am here today with Samantha Ribb. Samantha's got seven years clean, and um, she's going to tell us the story of her um, adventures from addiction to becoming clean, from addiction to sobriety. And we want to remind you that this podcast, this channel is about addiction and recovery. So it's not always pretty. People tell their no holds barred stories. And so there may be things that trigger some people, upset some people. There could be cussing. So I just want to make sure that you are all prepared <laughs> for anything that you not that Samantha is necessarily going to do any of these things, but you know, we don't know. And it's not like we ask ahead of time. So um, without further ado, I'm going to let Samantha take over and start her story. Hey, thanks for being here, by the way. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. Of this course. is really cool, um, especially with not being able to get to meetings because of COVID and everything. Um, it's, it's really cool to be able to share my story with people and just talk with another addict and just have that fellowship back again. So Yeah, yeah <laughs> we really appreciate you being here for the same, yeah. the same reasons. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And um, if you're watching on YouTube, you probably see my cat um, barging his face in as well. So try, try to ignore him. Um, I'll do my best not to curse. Um, I, in real life, have a bit of a sailor's mouth, but I will, um, I'll do my best. Um, but like you said, some of my story is not PG. Mm -hmm. So I will try to keep that um, as, yeah. as palatable as I can. You know, um, addiction stories aren't, or they wouldn't be, you know, addiction stories, really. Yeah, you know, oh. absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, I, so I grew up in a very strict religious household. Um, I went to religious school from K through 12, and my high school years was actually at an all-girls school. Um, so um, I, I really didn't have a lot of opportunity to learn to recognize my own emotions and my own problems um, because you know in in at least the environment that I was in um, emotions were shamed and discouraged they were kind of um, you were Especially kind of seen as children yeah absolutely yeah, yeah you I've were kind of the same environment yeah you were you were seen as almost dramatic mm -hmm. and just kind of like, oh, we don't, we don't talk about that. Kids are resilient. You'll just get over it. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, pe so many people have it worse. You know, yeah. you need to just, just deal with it. You'll be fine. Um, and, you know, and, and that was everything from physical pain. Uh, you know, I have injuries now that um, were just never diagnosed and never, hmm. never addressed because it was just that very, like, um, give it to God and you know, just deal with it on your own, you'll be fine kind of mentality. Um, my parents never drank. I saw my mom take one sip of champagne one time when I was 13, and that was um, at a, it was a like a congratulatory toast. It wasn't like, hey, I'm gonna have some champagne with dinner or anything like that. Um, so I never, and I would say probably even until this day, you know, I'm 34 years old, I never really saw firsthand what healthy drinking looked like. So when drinking became available to me, and when I started to become unsupervised in college, um, I, I was alcoholic from the first drink. Um, That's an interesting perspective, you know, yeah. you don't think about healthy drinking, you know, even if your parents who don't drink, talking about what healthy drinking is, right? You know, because we're not saying, you know, as parents, you have to, you should drink and you should model right. it. But I mean, even just talking about it, you know, it just wasn't addressed at all, was it? No, you know, it wasn't. And, you know, again, with, you know, being in the religious community that I was in <clears throat> and even my extended family, uh, they didn't drink, um, especially if, if children were around. I mean, you, you would hear stories of like, oh, uncle so-and-so had a couple beers and got tipsy and everyone was like, <gasps> you know, um, you just, you just didn't hear about it. Um, so, you know, I, I can still remember my first drink. Um, I can still remember exactly where I was and who I was with and, and all of that. Um, and then, 
you know, from, from there, it just got progressively worse. You know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't stop drinking Mm -hmm. until I felt like I was, I was done. Like I, I physically cannot take another drink or else, you know, I will be sick or, um, I will black out. And sometimes even at that point I would continue to drink. Um, right. And, uh, you know, and then as, as I matured and grew, grew a little bit older, kind of graduated college, was out on my own. I was working, um, I was working in a very professional field. Um, and it, it for, for background, I, um, live now and grew up in Baltimore city, okay. which is, um, it's about as easy to get a hold of drugs as it is to get a hold of a Coca-Cola. It's just, that's just the city that it, that's just yep. the way it is. I lived right outside Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I- so, um, you know, I, I started to realize like, Hey, like I don't actually have to stop drinking when I feel like that. I can graduate to other substances that are going to help me keep drinking. Mm -hmm. Um, So I started doing some stimulants to extend my, my drinking time. Um, and that was, um, that wasn't really a problem for me. Drinking was the core problem. Um, the stimulants was really just so that I could continue to drink. It wasn't right. I never sat or I was never sitting around on a, you know, Thursday and thought like, Hey, let's go do some Coke. Like it just never, it, that just wasn't the thing. Um, and then, you know, I really started to decide like, I think I'd like to find a boyfriend. I think I'd like to find someone to share my craziness with. Um, and I got on these dating sites and, you know, I met, um, I met this one guy, we went on one date, uh, we were, I remember we were in a bar, and I had, I want to say it was like two Miller lights, like nothing crazy, um, and that was at like 9 p.m., and I didn't, I came to the next day at 11.30. Oh, wow. Um, in the morning, and I had, um, like bruises all over my neck, um, I wasn't wearing any clothes, I was, thankfully in my apartment, which was good, but he was nowhere to be found. Um, I had flashes of a rape basically occurring and I, you know, had all these bruises and the next day I decided like, this has gotten out of hand. I've, I've gotten myself hurt now. Right. Right. Um, so I, um, I reached out to a friend who I knew was in AA and I'll never forget. He said to me, have you finally had enough? <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's usually what they ask. <laughs> I said, yes, I've had enough. <laughs> and, um, I went to my first meeting that day. Um, I was throwing up in the bushes outside of the meeting because I was just kind of like going through withdrawals and I'm right. shaking and, um, and I have not had a drink since. Um, and that was August 15th, 2013. Wow. Wow. Um, now, was that not, the first time you tried to get sober? So the, fr- <laughs> the first time was just because, <laughs> just because I was, um, it was about a year prior to that. And I had been missing a lot of work from hangovers. And I thought, well, I'll, I'm going to stop. Like, I'm just going to slow down. Um, and I went like 90 days without having anything to drink. Um, but I was white knuckling it. I, I didn't have anybody to talk to. I didn't know where to even go. Um, and then my college had alumni day and I went up to go visit my sorority and I thought, well, I can just drink this one weekend as like a special occasion and then go, right. Yeah. And then go back. Because that always works. Right. And then go back to being sober. And, you know, I drank that weekend and literally immediately the problem started again. I was on, I went to school in Pennsylvania. I was on my way home from Pennsylvania to Baltimore. Um, I got pulled over by a state trooper. I give him my license and he says, ma'am, there is still cocaine on your license. And I was like, oh, Lord. okay. <laughs> um, 
I didn't get in trouble, thankfully. I think he just didn't want to deal with it. But um, I got a ticket. I got a really expensive ticket, which was not good. But, um, um, but then, yeah, I went back out for like a year um, until until the uh, the final time in, in August of 2013. So it's, um, you know, since 2013, um, a lot has happened in my life. Um, I would say, you know, a lot of people say that their first year of sobriety is the hardest. Mm -hmm. um, for me, absolutely, the second year, my second year was the worst year of my life. Oh, yeah? Um, just for tons of different reasons. Um, you know, I had someone very close to me pass away from uh, leukemia. I, um, my parents separated that year. Um, they both disowned me for about eight months because um, I was no longer involved in the religious community that, that they were in. Mm -hmm. um, I lost my job, even after getting sober. Uh, it, it's, yeah, it's well, just... Wait, wait, that's, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, all my problems are supposed to be solved. Exactly. Well, exactly. And, you know, I think something that a lot of people expect is that, you know, as soon as you stop drinking, that that everything's going to be rainbows and sunshine. And, right. you know, for me, that that fog just hadn't lifted yet. And I was still in kind of a sick mindset. And, you know, it's the only job I've ever been fired from. And I will be the first to say that I deserve to be fired from it. Um, I was not doing the right things. I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. And, um, you know, and that happened. But yeah, it's um, me. somehow, somehow, I was never fired. I should have been fired like 50 times over, you know, and mm -hmm. somehow because I was, and when I say functional, I mean like fairly functional. I could show up, yeah, <laughs> you know, but wasn't doing a very good job. Of yeah. And if they were desperate, I promise you I'd have been, I'd have been done. Yeah. So yeah, and it took me a long time. I don't know if this is your experience, but after cleaning up and, you know, sobering up, because alcohol was my main thing also, um, it took me a while to grow up. Because yes. I kind of stopped growing from the time I started partying, you know, mm -hmm. and I, so I never did that growing up. Is that what, it, was that kind of your experience too, or? You know, absolutely. Um, I like to joke sometimes because you know some people make fun of me especially I, I don't know if, if any other ladies especially if you're um, active on the internet kind of experience maybe a little bit of shame or ridicule for being childless at a certain age mm -hmm. um, I've been person at 35 yeah so you know I'm 34 um, I'm not married and I don't have children and I don't know if I want either of those things in my future mm -hmm. um, and you know I I tell people all the time, like, I, I started adult life, like, when most people were already married with children. Yeah. Um, um, I catch myself even still seven years clean and sober, um, letting my emotions get the best of me because I just don't, I don't really have great coping skills for them. Mm -hmm. um, a million times better than they were. And I'm, you know, I'm working closely with my counselor to get where I need to be. Um, right. But, um, you know, I, I like you said, I, I do catch myself every so often being a little bit emotionally immature and doing my best to recognize it immediately and, you know, correct course. But yeah, yeah. it doesn't no, always I, happen that way. One advantage, though, I did, I have noticed that one advantage is if I'm in a group and let's say it's, I'm, I'm going to be 44 Tuesday and let's say that it's people in their twenties, I can still talk to them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I can, I can, you know, I'm not trying to convince the world that I'm still cool. Okay. I drive. Right. I'm, I've accepted this. I own it, but <laughs> I can still have a conversation with them because my brain kind of goes, Hey, we get you. We get where you're coming from. And yeah. then people my age, 
you know, as I've learned to kind of grow up, you know, I can talk to them too. And I'm also lucky enough to have friends that go, um, you should stop doing <laughs> you know, like you should probably stop doing what you're doing right now because I'll still slip into immaturity. You know, yep. I think that's just part and parcel with growing in recovery. You are literally growing in recovery. Absolutely. You know, it's tough. It is, um, it's tough, but thankfully, you know, at least through working the steps and, you know, doing the things that we need to do for our own mental health, we're able at least. I'll speak for myself, I guess, um, able to recognize it quicker mm -hmm. than I used to. Um, and even kind of recognizing myself sliding into addictive or addiction type behaviors um, might not be drugs or alcohol, but right um, might be like shopping. Like if I notice that I'm starting to overspend, I'm like, okay, what's going on? Retail what therapy. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I do so, that. I do. You know what I started doing? is I because it doesn't matter if I take Amazon or anything off I put things in the cart mm -hmm. and then like I'll let my husband know and he'll just empty the cart <laughs> so I don't buy it but it just gives me that almost that fix <laughs> I'm just yeah. putting it all in the cart you know and then because it's it is it's the addictive behavior we have that addictive personality that's never going away. Whether we're binge watching a TV show, we have to finish it and we have to finish it tonight. You know, yes. <laughs> or, you know, I don't want to go to work. I want to watch this TV show, but I, I go to work now, you know, right. But, or, <laughs> right? <laughs> or if it's retail or eating like, Oh my God, I have a cereal problem. Eating for sure. Um, my cell phone mm -hmm. is another thing. I'm just compulsively checking it just for that little burst of serotonin of, you know, how many new followers did I get? How many new followers? Like how many more people like me? Like, so I, ha I really have to limit myself that, you know, after a certain time of day, like we're not checking the phone anymore. You know, right. TikTok is staying closed. Um, YouTube is, YouTube's being turned off. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I have to, um, then I have to watch myself because you've got all these smart TVs now that I don't turn on YouTube on my TV and end up in a hole video hole watching you know yeah squirrels jumping from tree to tree or some craziness yeah like i'm gonna be good i'm gonna go to bed at 10 11 30 it's like oh crap <laughs> <laughs> i did it again exactly okay. that's exactly what it is so the addictive behavior follows us into everything and we just have to find ways you know and i i tell this story and i i said this on another one of my interviews and it's because it's so true this one man pretty sure he was a he was either a he had become a therapist and was an addict or he was a therapist who works with a lot of addicts but he's spot on because he said in active addiction you have a bike with two flat tires 60 cents in your pocket it's storming outside and where you need to get is six miles down the road I guarantee you at 5 p.m. you will have figured out a way to get money, find transportation, make it to where you need to go and get what you needed to get. If you put one ounce of that kind of energy into your recovery, you'd all be millionaires, you know, yeah. like into just positive stuff. We'd all be millionaires. And it's so true. It it's, is so you know, true. It's so true. And I definitely resonate with the uh, 60 cents in your pocket thing because I can, now I'm making, you know, my salary is higher than it's ever been. Um, and I am constantly worried, like, do I have enough? Do I have enough to cover this? Do I have enough to cover that? And then I'm like, I remember when I was making, like, back then the minimum wage, I think it was like eight something. I was making like eight bucks an hour, somehow managing not to get evicted from my apartment and drinking like a crazy person. Like, <laughs> How did I manage all that money? Like what? I know. I know. And, and, and like, so we live in this state of lack for some reason. Yeah. Like instead of going, I have enough, I have plenty, I have, and kind of, you know, manifesting positivity. It's, it's, I, I don't know where that comes from, but all of a sudden we just start to panic because it's like, you paid for all your stuff in active addiction, you know, and, and, 
disclaimer, we both understand that some people did not and could not. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I was in and out of my parents' house, you know, only child. So, you know, I had that revolving door until one day they were like, it's about to slam shut. Yeah. <laughs> you have yeah. to choose. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. It, and, and it's, there are, people have, have said, you know, I don't know how you can handle, you know, always being an addict. You're always an addict. And it's not necessarily that I'm always craving, you know, scotch or right. whatever. It could just be that I sit on TikTok for two hours or, you know, it doesn't have to be completely detrimental to my life to be addiction. You know, it yeah. could just make me fat. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, and it's... One benefit that it has had for me, at least, is that um, when it comes to my work, I have to do a lot of problem solving, and my obsessive thoughts do not shut up until I have solved the problem. So <laughs> that's kind of a benefit. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's to me. That's taking that one ounce and putting yeah. it on something positive, and it's like, look how productive I am. It, it's true. I kid you not. I took. I made very good money being a sign language interpreter. But I would work, 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 because I was, uh, I was addicted to that, you know, and I realized I wanted to be with my kids more. So I took like a 25 plus dollar pay cut to work at Cracker Barrel, and I'm going somewhere with this. Right. You had better believe that the decorations right now at the Cracker Barrel in Aiken, South Carolina are amazing. <laughs> and, you know, the displays, there are no holes because I can't handle the holes, you know, so it's true. If we just take that one little ounce and put it to something positive, now all of a sudden it's like, dang, you're employee of the year, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> you're set to take over the company when I retire. And it's like, really? Me? You know, so addiction, it's a word that has a stigma attached to yes. it, you know, but you can use an addictive personality for positive results. You really can. Right. You know? And I have a friend, my mentor uh, that I interviewed, Kevin Parker. He says, everybody's an addict. Everybody's an addict, whether they want to admit it or not. Whether it's, you know, work, money, food, books, you know, all addictions aren't negative, you know, but addiction needs to unless it's associated with you know drugs right. alcohol porn self-harm whatever um doesn't always have to be associated with negativity you know you Absolutely. can't take that and turn it into a superpower yeah <laughs> and some people have really um really excelled with that i mean there are some extremely successful people that yeah are recovering addicts um and they've just Absolutely. used that personality uh defect maybe um trait <laughs> trait yeah. or trait eccentricity <laughs> um you know to their benefit and and to the benefit of those that they help so exactly exactly yeah. well samantha thank you so much sure. for being willing to come on here and share your story and then just chat about stuff a little bit after now you can find samantha on tiktok what's your uh tiktok handle Oh boy. Um, so I have a main account, um, mm -hmm. which is Sam on social. So it's Sam dot on dot social. Um, and then I have an account that's dedicated just to recovery stuff, which is Sam in sobriety, Sam dot in dot sobriety. Excellent. Excellent. So go follow her, get some, you know, get a good example of what recovery looks like a good example of what an independent woman looks like if you're somebody who is like you know what society i don't necessarily want to have kids i wanted to have kids and look what happened i wanted to yeah. change i have an eight year old <laughs> triplets <laughs> I, I wouldn't trade them i wouldn't trade them but if you're somebody who's like you know what no i'm good being with me you know you can get some reassurance and some positivity there too. So, I mean, Samantha has a lot more to offer than only addiction, you know? So obviously her cat loves her.